Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this International Day of Women in Astronomy and Science. Uh, we're here to celebrate that day as well as talk a little bit about uh, the Astronomical League and we're in its 75th year. Uh, this is our 75th anniversary, which will actually be on November 15th, uh, 2021. So we're leading up to that. This is one of the events we would like to do is, is features uh, women in astronomy, especially on this International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Um, we have been, as I just said, in 75 years in existence, come a long way. We started out with about a couple thousand members, but now we're up well over 18,000 of the Astronomical League. Oh, by the way, my name is John Goss, but I didn't say that. Uh, I'm former president of the league from 2014 to 2018. Um, but since uh, 1946, we have instituted a lot of observing clubs, a lot of award systems, a lot of, uh, we have a, a a uh, quarterly magazine, a, a great one called, called The Reflector. Um, so we've come a long way and we're gonna continue doing what we'd like to do best and that is promote amateur astronomy to our members and the public. Um, today though, we're gonna talk uh, with uh, Mo Molly Wakeling who is an Astronomical League member. She's, um, she's done quite a bit with her um, astronomical pursuits so far and we're, we'll be talking a little bit about that. But first I'd like to show something to everybody. Uh, essentially how I met Molly back in 2017, do a little, little screen share. Molly was the uh, second place winner of our uh, Astro Imaging Award in the Deep Space, uh, Deep Sky Object Competition. Obviously this is the Rosette Nebula. I, I think it's a really wonderful rendition. It's, uh, it's pretty, this is one of the prettiest nebulas around and uh, Molly captured it really well. And she'll probably talk a little bit about, maybe not, not about this, this photograph, but her uh, experiences in imaging and how she has gotten interested in it and where she intends to go from there. So with that happy note, um, Molly, um, I'd like to turn things over to you. If you could uh, give yourself a, a short uh, uh, a bio there so people know who you are and what you're up to. Take it away, Molly. Sure. Hi, um, I am currently a PhD student in, uh, in physics in, at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, I've been doing astrophotography since 2015 when I got my first telescope as a gift. And uh, it's really kind of uh, exploded from there, from this one telescope to now I have a, a backyard setup of, of three telescope rigs. Uh, including one for doing scientific measurements for the American Association of Variable Star Observers, as well as um, getting into uh, NASA's Exoplanet Watch program, doing a bit of that as well. Um, I've been, I, I've gotten to go to several star parties over the last couple of years, and I'm hoping to go to the Texas Star Party again this year. I I am uh, an AABSO ambassador, for, so the American Association of Variable Star Observers, and also an Explore Alliance ambassador, which is a program with Explore Scientific to extend uh, the wonders of astronomy to the public. And I'm currently a member of the East Bay Astronomical Society here in the Bay Area. That's, that's great. You, you're, um, you're involved in quite a bit. So your time is, you probably have this much time to devote to this talk today. And I really appreciate, <laughs> you, appreciate you doing so. Um, to our audience, I'd also like to uh, introduce our other member today is uh, Terry Mann, who is current secretary of the Astronomical League. She has also been uh, president in the past. She is very involved in imaging. Uh, she's very involved in the light pollution, battling light pollution effort. So she's been around for a while and, and uh, she knows what's going on. But I'm glad that she has uh, volunteered to help us out today. So thank you, Terry. Um, <laughs> sure, Jeff. <laughs> I'd like to uh, start out just, just with a few questions for, for, for Molly. It's not like we're putting you on the spot or anything. Uh, and it's not like I'm an expert at this with women in astronomy. But you know, uh, the, the fact is, uh, we have a, a pretty much male dominated hobby. Um, not, not completely, but still, uh, it'd be nice to have it, it more uh, equitable uh, for both men and women. Um, I've raised three daughters. And they're all adults now, but I noticed uh, when they were growing up, I'd say when they were 10, 11 years old or so, they were all pretty much interested in science. 
and as they got in, into their teens and so on, uh, they still may voice an interest in science, but it seemed to slack quite a bit. And I, I think I've noticed this with, with a, a, lot of, a lot of girls, especially at uh, ob observing sessions. You know, you, you, you'd have a, a public come out and, and look at something through the telescope Saturday and all that stuff. And you'd have a line of people and you know, people are going, yeah, this is really nice. But then you'd have a, a, a girl who's 10 years old that looked through that telescope and it is, oh, wow. And she starts rattling off facts and figures of Saturn. And you know, I'm just kind of shrugging my shoulders. Says, no, I don't know how many moons it has, it has a whole lot, but no, no, it is 72. <laughs> oh, okay. But you know, so they're very, very enthusiastic and interested in it. Um, I was wondering your thoughts on that, on, on why, have, have you seen this yourself, for instance? And, yeah, yeah. I, and I've done a, why, has, why do they drop off when it comes to teenagerhood? Yeah, uh, so I I've, I've also, I've do a lot of uh, outreach and uh, got to do a lot of those public star parties uh, in the past, back when we could do those things. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I saw a very similar thing where a lot of uh, young women were, were interested and um, uh, seemed to know a lot of the facts and stuff like that, which was a lot of fun. Um, but uh, so, so I'm, a, I'm also a Girl Scout leader is, is one of my other side hobbies. <laughs> and uh, so I see a lot of this in, in a lot of the same kind of thing in Girl Scouts where um, girls tend to start to leave the program at about that, that middle school age. And um, it, it, it's, it, it appears that a lot of that has to do with, um, with peer pressure and with, um, you know, trying not to look too nerdy and things like that. Uh, now, for me in particular, growing up, Girl Scouts gave me the mindset of like, it's okay to, to be different and to pursue the things that you're really interested in. And that sunk into my brain really deeply. And actually, like, like the reason I decided to go into science, I think, was largely based on the fact that there's not a lot of women in it. And I wanted to, like, kind of break that mold. And that's just kind of who I am as a person. <laughs> but um, so, you know, and it was because of, of that, that I, uh, I think that's what, that's what drew me to doing science was because of its unusualness for, for women. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, there's kind of a joke with uh, some of the, some of my friends in, in different clubs in that they're talking about how to get young people in, into amateur astronomy. And I tell them, all you have to do is, is, is get some girls interested in it. You know, the boys will come. If, if the girls are there, the boys will come. <laughs> so that's, that's the whole secret here. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a tough nut to crack, and uh, and you know, I see, I see a lot of that with with what Girl Scouts has been trying to do to to keep uh, women in the organization and through through high school, and um, it's it's hard to do to to kind of vie for that time, especially when there's a lot of other activities mm. um, that uh, that we're involved in, and um, I think the reason astronomy has a lot of of um, of men in it is because it also has a lot of older folks in it in general. Um, I, I think it tends to be a bit of a retirement hobby, partly because of the time of day required for it, <laughs> and partly because of the money required for it. Um, but with with astrophotography these days, with uh, digital sensors and um, uh, like the ability to to you, you can get started in astrophotography really cheap now. You don't need really fancy equipment. And I think that's gonna be a pathway for more young people to get into the hobby and more women. Um, I'm in a group uh, called Stella that is, of, uh, that is a group for women astrophotographers and the majority of us are in my age bracket. And, and I think a lot of that is driven by the fact that we can use technology to get involved in this. Uh, and that's a, a, a really good pathway for a lot of people in my generation. Mm -hmm. By the way, I like like your cat on the windowsill up there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep, he's uh, he's napping up here. <laughs> she, she was awake all night observing, obviously, so she needs her sleep now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I personally am not a, a, an an imager. Um, it is pretty interesting though, so I don't know a whole heck of a lot how it's done. And I know Terry Terry Mann's been involved in this for quite some time. Uh, yeah. Terry, how, how did you get involved in, in the imaging aspect of astronomy? You know, I always liked photography and I always liked astronomy. I, I mean, even as a teenager, I can remember being in, liking astronomy. Um, and since I liked photography, it just became a natural fit 
the first thing I did as soon as I bought my own camera was put it on the telescope and took a picture of the moon. It was just a normal fit. During the day, I would, you know, do landscape or whatever. And then I thought, wow, I don't care. It was six, the first night I took an astro image was the moon with a six inch reflector. And it was something like six below that night. But I couldn't wait to get that camera on that telescope to take a picture of the moon. So yeah. I, it was just kind of, for me, it was built in. Um, I was always amazed looking up at the stars, always. Minus six degrees would uh, certainly hurry you along. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I think when I did my first picture, that very first picture at six below was one of my best at the very beginning because I, I just did it. You know, I didn't overthink anything. I put it on there, put everything together and it just clicked. But yeah, um, you know, and stuff like that is just something for me that I, I remember in great detail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Molly, when, when you started out, you were a member of a club. Is, is that correct? I actually didn't join the club for the first six months that I, uh, that I was doing the imaging. I didn't even know it existed. One of my, uh, one of my friends said uh, when he was seeing some of the pictures I was posting, said, hey, you should come join this astronomy club. Uh, so I, I finally joined six months after I started doing astrophotography and that opened up a, a gateway for me to, to learn more skills and to have a place to go because we had an observatory. Um, so I could, I could go out there and set up my equipment instead of, um, setting up like where the, where the, um, the park rangers were always finding me with their headlights. <laughs> <laughs> Well, did, did you find, uh, one of the main reasons people join clubs is for mentoring, to have somebody show them what to do and, and the ropes and all that. Was that in your case also? Was someone in the club help you along? And you yeah, uh, uh, John Chumack is, uh, is a prolific astrophotographer who was in the Miami Valley Club. And uh, he gave me a lot of advice and a lot of tips. And uh, as well as um, my friend who recruited me to the club, Will, uh, he'd been doing some astrophotography as well and helped me learn how to guide and how to um, use the equatorial mount and stuff like that. Uh, and, and I, I'm the kind of person I, I like to tinker. I, I figured out a lot of stuff on my own, mm -hmm. but um, I got, I got lots of advice and, and other help from, uh, particularly from John Tumac and from other members of the club as well. And some members of the club uh, who were getting on in years and were kind of looking to start getting rid of some of their equipment often liked to pass along to me. So I actually got quite a lot of gear from members of the club, from filters to, uh, to cameras, to even a, a, a telescope. So uh, then I was uh, able to expand even further. Sure. Well, I know that's a prime reason for joining a club is to get that advice from, from the older, more experienced people. And uh, you know, I have to be careful putting my, my foot in my mouth and saying this, but uh, just about every club has one or two members who are very eager to share their knowledge with you, <laughs> so, which is good. You know, I, I, that, that's always a, 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 a big benefit. Um, so having mentors like that, that, that helps, helps introduce young people, women, into the hobby. So that, that's a good thing to have, or, or mentors who actually come out and do this stuff. Yeah, and even just just people who who are kind of cheerleaders, you know, who who say like that's a really awesome image, you know, keep up the good work, or um, mm -hmm. are just uh, are glad to see you at the club meetings, even, you know, just just uh, people who are friendly and think what you're doing is cool, just to keep you excited about it as well, especially during the parts of astrophotography that get really difficult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when when you join your club or when you got interested. It was pretty much just you. You didn't have a, a gang or friends with you at this at, at that point. So it was pretty much an individual effort on your part. And I, I think that's that's probably the way it is with, with most people, uh, male or female. Uh, they they enter it pretty much on their own for because they think it's pretty cool and they want to want to try it out. Um, was there anything uh, really preventing you uh, from taking up amateur astronomy and then going in into your career path or? I, well, I asked for a telescope a lot when I was younger because uh, I, I was in a, I was into astronomy as a science from as long as I could remember, you know, first, second grade, something like that. And I had repeatedly asked for a telescope over the years, but we could never afford one. Uh, and I don't think my parents would even have known what to look for anyway. <laughs> um, and so it was it was that gift from a, uh, a then boyfriend, actually, that um, uh, that really got me jump started into it. 
and I had a very similar experience to Terry where I got that telescope and like my, my second or third night out, I figured out that there was a device I could buy to attach my, my camera to it. And uh, that was that was that, you know, I went, I didn't really spend any time doing visual observing myself. I just, I was just like, man, like look at Saturn. This is so cool. I got to share it with all my friends. I got to figure out how to take a picture of this thing. And that's kind of where it went from there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so going, going back in all the years back to high school, uh, were, were you a participant in science fairs or anything like that? Any, you know, so I grew up in, in uh, Spokane, Washington, which does not really have much of a technical industry. There was a big uh, medical industry there, but um, not much in the way of a technical industry. So we had very little in the way of like science related clubs and activities and, and things like that. Um, so I never actually did any science related stuff when I was growing up beyond watching Nova on PBS and, yeah. and Maddox School Bus and reading books and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I got Discover Magazine and and whatnot, but uh, never really got, we didn't have science fairs really. I think there was one when I was in fifth grade. Um, we didn't have a lot of like STEM clubs or anything like that. So it's kind of on my own for that. <laughs> yeah, as a, as a, to show you where I'm coming from, I, I grew up in Washington state too. Oh really? Uh, close to Seattle. And okay. in a science fair, I made a, a true astronomer. I ground a mirror and uh, of course, in the ensuing years, that mirror has long, long disappeared. But you know that that is something kids can still do uh, it, if they have the uh, uh, wherewithal to, to, to spend all the time and effort in making mirrors and going to astronomy that way. Uh, most people just just buy the stuff now because it is it's all pretty cheap, pretty pretty economical for for mo mo most people. Um, Terry, do, do you have anything uh, you'd like to ask uh, Molly at the moment? Yeah, let's go back at the beginning, Molly. Um, go into a little more detail. When did you first even notice the stars? I mean, when, you know, you talked about jo not joining the club for six months. Um, how, were you younger? Were you older when you even knew about astronomy? I mean, I, I knew about a lot about it as a, as a science. Like, you know, I, I read a lot about black holes and supernovas and all those things that kids are really into. Um, you know, all, all the kind of um, the big explosive stuff in the universe. And I loved reading about the Big Bang and um, cosmology and how star stellar interiors worked and stuff like that. But as far as the observational aspect of astronomy, like knowing the constellations and knowing about what kinds of objects are up there, what we can see, I had no idea about any of that when I started. I never, you know, I, I could recognize Orion's belt when I was a kid and I wondered why like you know I'd look for it in like the summertime and not sure not be sure where it was at didn't really pay attention to the motion of the stars the planets or anything when I was yeah. growing up. <laughs> yeah so did you kind of notice it as you got into school like we did science fairs all of that um I was always involved in that were you ever involved in science fairs in schools? I I got to to judge a few when I was um uh like a, a couple of years back at the end of college, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I again never really never really got into that scene. We didn't really have a lot of that scene in in my hometown. Um, yeah, <laughs> and I think that's part of the tougher part too, especially with girls. Um, I'm in a small rural area. Uh, I am the only as amateur astronomer that's even in this area, and so most of the time when there's something going on in the sky usually you know there'll be people that will call me because you're the only one really in that area that has done it for a while um did you find that out too as you came up as you learned you were more in college though weren't you by the time you had really yeah gotten yeah. into yeah well, my, my friends started asking me um i so like you know they, they would hear about um some astronomical event that was happening or some new discovery that had made the, the mainstream news and they'd ask me about it and what it was or uh, or even some some physics things like like the the faster than light neutrinos um, that turned out to be a uh, an accident of how the data was interpreted like a lot of my friends would, would ask me about that and a lot of my family now on on Facebook will will send me like hey like is this is this picture legit or is this like a real thing you know so it's, it's kind of fun to uh, to, to teach them. And yeah. uh, I think I think they are, you know, because like 
now my grandma almost had been, she was like, I think this is fake. Will you like, you know, tell me that it is or not? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Did you, then when you judge the science fair, did you notice there were more boys than girls? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the lack of astronomy sometimes I judged some high school ones and I, the teachers actually would come up to me and ask me for recommendations on books because they really didn't cover a lot of astronomy, especially in high school. Did you kind of see the same thing? Um, like, uh, actually, I don't. I think there was a little bit of, of astronomy topics uh, at at this at the science fair, um, but yeah, um, yeah. I, well, in the, in high school, you know, they, they cover a wide variety of of things. I think that kind of varies from place to place. Because I I know we had a, a unit on astronomy when when I was in high school, and you know, that was always my favorite unit. Uh, <laughs> whenever we got to do that. <laughs> Um, uh, and, and throughout elementary and middle school too, we'd have those units on, on astronomy and units on biology and kind of all over the place. Um, so I think I saw about as much astronomy there as other topics. It was pretty, pretty varied among the types of topics that were there. Yeah. What about now the people that are around you? Are there a lot of people? I mean, we know the people in astronomy clubs, we're all interested. Do you see a lot of women right now interested uh, that are say your age in astronomy that you're around? Well, I will say that um, a, lot of, a lot of women who are in the sciences uh, or the hard sciences, if you will, um, tend to drift toward astronomy. A lot of, uh, I think there's there's a higher percentage of women in the astronomy department than there are in any other of the hard, hard science departments. And um, I see a lot more women astronomers being the lead authors and the people who are interviewed for uh, news articles about astronomical events than any other type of science. So I think w women who do go into science tends to drift toward astronomy and um, not entirely sure why that is, but maybe part of it was because um, that's the only, uh, the main place in science where women in the past century have made their mark. Uh, you know, you see women as early as the early 20th century or, or before that too, um, actually having their names attached to things uh, more than you see in any other field of science. So that, I think that's, those two are potentially linked, I think. Yeah. What I think about you really have to see people who are like you doing a thing that you think you might want to do in order to have the idea planted in your head that you can do it. And seeing, uh, you know, when you hear about Vera Rubin and you hear about um, uh, other women in, in astronomy in the past, um, you can kind of imagine yourself there maybe more than a particle physicist or um, a biologist or something like that. When you can see those women who have come before you in those roles. I, I have a story to, to tell you right now. Um, sure. We have a university near us, uh, James Madison University, and they had something called a uh, Youth Explorers Science Camp every summer, which kids would come in and they'd talk about science and stuff, obviously. Uh, but the very first activity that the kids would do, they have them all sit in a big auditorium and, and the guy would stand up in front and, and talk. And he said, what I want you to do is get out pen and paper and draw me a picture of a scientist. Okay. Draw, fix it now. They scribble it away. And he said something like, okay, go ahead and save, save that picture. Then at the end of the week, when they're, uh, when the, as they're concluding uh, the, the camp, he comes up and he says it again. Okay, now draw me another picture of a scientist. Um, they scribble it out. And they compare the two pictures. The first scientist looks more like the older white guy balding, wearing the white lab coat type picture. And then the final picture looks more like themselves. You know, the, the girl would draw a girl and the boy would draw a boy looking kind of like himself. And uh, I think that really emphasized that if kids are around people who, uh, who enjoy scientists, science and who promote science and show them what other scientists have done, they come away with the mindset that, hey, that could be me doing that. Is that something that you agree with there? Do you kind of, kind of Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it goes not only for gender, but for race as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, when people see somebody who is their same race doing, uh, doing, so doing something like science, then they can kind of get into their head that, hey, you know, uh, they're black, I'm black, I can do that too. Um, and, and I think this, it goes for both. Um, but I, I've seen articles like that with, with young children as well, I mean, kids in elementary school, 
Um, and over the years, there's actually been a growing number of, uh, you know, when they do these studies with kids um, who are drawing women scientists more often because we're being highlighted more, I think. And I think the efforts of organizations to highlight their women in STEM has been making a difference because now you have these kids who see see more women in, in, in the sciences and imagine women more as scientists. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for, for the boys too. Um, I, I did some some uh, Boy Scout work uh, previously as well, uh, doing some having bringing uh, doing astronomy merit badges and things like that, um, because it, the boys need to get an idea that there's women in the sciences as well, because then that's a more familiar idea to them when they come up to college, and and that can kind of help reduce that unconscious bias that that we have. Um, for so not only do, do do young women need to see other women in science, but young men need to as well. I think it makes an impact. Good point. Good point. It works both ways, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, another question I had uh, along these lines, it, you're in uh, nuclear engineering, correct? Uh, yeah, I did some uh, nuclear physics work uh, in the past, yeah. Nuclear physics, okay. Uh, I was just wondering on, as far as astronomy goes and in, in graduate school, um, what do you think the ratio is from male to female in graduate school? Because I'm thinking that, okay, if you're in graduate school, well, that means these people are tomorrow's scientists. And so, you know, if, if it's 50-50, then you think, okay, that's, that's good. Because in the next few years, you'll have these 50-50 ratios out there. But if it's still not, not uh, equal like that or close, then uh, there still may be a big problem in getting women into astronomy. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, we're still, yeah, there's still very much a, uh, what we call a, a pipeline issue where um, like uh, in, in the physics department here, um, there's, uh, I, I don't know the exact numbers because um, the people who I see all the time in my class, I don't think is my entire class. Um, uh, some people just don't come to social events and whatnot, but it still hovers around like the 15 to maybe 20% women uh, kind of mark in, in physics here at least. and. Um, and, you know, cause we're still in a position where there's very few women professors. Mm -hmm. And I think the same, even when you're a graduate student or considering being a graduate student, you still kind of have that, that idea or you're looking for somebody who is like you. Uh, and uh, it, women who, who even get their bachelor's degree in, in something like physics still, I think have a, a greater proportion of going into other things and not pursuing graduate education. I think part of that is at least some part of that is because there's still very few women professors to, you know, to kind of, to be that example of women in the sciences and also to in specifically encourage women to continue on that graduate level path. I had one female professor in, uh, in, in anything STEM related the entire time I was an undergraduate. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, there's still, uh, it, it's kind of a, a bit of a self-perpetuating problem. I think the, the numbers are slowly starting to expand, but it's a long process. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I hear what you just said then and what we were talking about a few minutes ago about um, um, people, uh, um, astronomers who are in the public's eye. For instance, you've seen these uh, documentaries they have on TV, uh, as you said, Nova and some other, other stations. Uh, other ideas there that they, uh, when they interview somebody, a lot of times they interview a, a woman scientist. Yeah. And then the next person they interview is another woman, and then another woman, and then maybe a man. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, does that mean that there are so many more women out there than men, or is this conscious of them promoting this, or what? I think uh, a lot of organizations are consciously choosing women to do those kinds of, of public. Uh, uh, public speaking events and, and things like that um, in, in the effort to get more women in the pipeline for, for the same reasons I just talked about where you can, you got to see that to kind of believe it in your head. Um, so I think, I think that's a conscious choice by organizations, uh, you know, schools and clubs and whatnot to, to have their women do those public events to, uh, to, so that when the younger kids see it, then they might decide that maybe they can go further in it. And so it's, it's a long process. You know, this is kind of a multi-generational thing uh, that's it's gonna take a while to equalize those numbers, but 
um, from what I've from what I've seen and from what I've heard when we talk about this topic at, at conferences, um, the numbers are increasing. It's it's just kind of slow because of you know the pipeline and this is kind of the, the buzzword. Yeah, I do think you're right. I mean, when people can look and see a woman doing whatever job or even a man in, in whatever title he might be in too, it really helps people to say, hey, I would really like to be that. And when they can look at somebody that's already doing that, they know that's, I mean, they might know it's possible in their mind, but when they see it's possible, I think that makes a big impact. Yes. Yeah. Especially in the beginning when you're younger, you realize more that, yeah, I can do anything too, you know, and I think that's real important, especially when you're a younger kid to know that, yeah, you know, I, I, I can be what I want to be as long as I'm going to work for it, I can do it. And I think sometimes that gets lost, you know, because it is hard. I'm sure everything that you have done has taken time and struggle and, you know, it's not an easy path to do or everybody would do it. But knowing somebody like you is there gives them the sight to realize what they can do. And I, I agree with you. I think that's tremendously important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the quote that I've seen that kind of encompasses this and I keep telling myself I'm going to remember who said it and then I always forget who exactly <laughs> said it. But uh, you cannot be what you cannot see is, is yeah. kind of the, what encompasses this idea. And, you know, you, you, there might not be a physical barrier to achieving something like, let's say, becoming an astronaut. You know, women are, are, can do that program now. But if you don't see women doing that, especially when you're young, you, you have a, you, you can't really imagine yourself right. being there. And you, that idea will kind of drop out of your head before you're in a position to work toward it. Uh, like, you know, get the degree that you need and um, uh, build up relevant experience and things like that. Yeah. I think you need encouragement along the way, you know, yeah. and, and I think parents, a lot of parents are very good at that. And then I think having the parents maybe behind you and somebody that you can see that is doing that helps keep your focus where you really want to go. And, and sometimes, you know, that is tough as you are a kid and you get older, you get sidetracked with a lot of other stuff. You know, but it helps being able, you know, say to look at an astronaut, if you really want to get into, you know, aeronautics, astronauts, whatever, that that's real important to be able to look at it. And, you know, having the times where they can actually ask questions to the astronauts to talk to these people, I think that makes a big difference, too. You know, yeah. just being able. And it makes that that personal connection and, and get, getting like if, if, if you're somebody out there who wants to support a, a young woman or a young man in your life doing something like this, um, you know, even if you can't, um, you know, necessarily like find them an opportunity to do something, even just those words of, of encouragement are hugely helpful. Um, you know, what, what kind of keeps, keeps my self-confidence and my ability to do these things high is when people tell me a lot that like, it's so cool that you're doing physics or like, can you, can you come give a talk at, at our club? Or um, like, I think you're really going places or just kind of those, those words of encouragement, even, even sometimes from perfect strangers, you know, I'll be at a public stargaze or um, on an airplane, you know, people have, we're talking about like, oh, you know, what do you, what do you do for a living and stuff like that? And people just think it's so cool that, that I am a physicist <laughs> and, um, you know, they'll, they'll say like, that's, you're going to go places, you know, and that, that keeps me going. Right. Those kind of those, uh, those words of affirmation. Um, so, and, and that I wouldn't say I had any single mentor at any point in my life. It's always just been, you know, people lending little bits of advice here and there or bits of encouragement here and there. Uh, and that kind of built up the foundation for me to believe in myself that I could do these things and to get through the really difficult parts of them, like, you know, passing this class or taking that exam and things like that. Just a few words of encouragement means a lot. Like if you can see it, you can be it. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and I do believe that that helps keep you focused. Um, I'd like to ask a big question. The, the big question, <laughs> shake things up with everything we just said and ask the big question is, what is it? <laughs> I have it written down. <laughs> <laughs> How, how do we bring more women into the astronomy, the hobby, the science, whatever? 
now we, we talked a little bit about, you just mentioned about having words of encouragement, okay? Uh, seeing people like yourself doing this stuff. Um, maybe have a, 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 a mentor who would help you along. Is there anything else, any other ways that we can encourage women, uh, girls, teenagers, college girls, and older women, you know, everybody, how, how to get them more interested in astronomy and, and pursuing it as a hobby or even, even a career? I don't know. Any thoughts on that? I think sometimes um, having somebody kind of guide you into it and to encourage you into it can, can make a huge difference where you're like, you're not really sure you can do it or if you're not really sure you're really interested. But if somebody's like, hey, like, come with me to this meeting or come with me to, to our club's stargaze or uh, come with me to this event, um, then that kind of uh, individual encouragement, I think can, can bring somebody in, in a way that is more comfortable. There was a girl in, in the astronomy club in Ohio who um, she, she was at the end of high school and was kind of looking at getting into astrophotography and I kind of adopted her as, as my minion <laughs> is what, what I called her <laughs> as my mentee. And um, you know, she could come to me with astrophotography questions. I would help her out when we were out on the field together and you know, kind of let her figure stuff out for a while. And if she was stuck, I'd go over and give her a hand and you know, say like, hey, I hope I see you at the next meeting or um, uh, and occasionally like I'd you know, get her a piece of equipment for her birthday or something, something she you know, just, if you had a tea ring, then you could attach your DSLR in this way. And you know, just something that uh, that's you know, a little step that was a big step for her and kept her engaged. And, um, and so kind of uh, like paying attention to a particular person and saying like, hey, like, I hope to see you at the next meeting. And, you know, oh, that, that picture you just, that you just produced is, is really awesome. You know, I can't wait to see your next one. Um, I think can be that, that supportive kind of environment that, uh, that makes people feel like they belong. No. Well, how about ways of taking that 10 year old girl who knows all the facts about Saturn and, and push her along? Have any suggestions on how to do that? Um, <laughs> That's the million dollar question. Right there. I just, I, for me personally, I try to, I try to be the example, you know, I, I think, uh, so kids are a lot more perceptive than, than you might think. And uh, working in, in Girl Scouts, I saw this a lot where um, when they, like you don't have to say something outright all the time for them to start to believe something. Um, some of the girls in my, in um, one of my Girl Scout troops, um, you know, they were, they kind of, I'm not sure what their initial interest in doing science was, but um, you know, I, I would bring up stuff I was doing at work or stuff I was doing at school. And by the time they graduated, one was like, I'm gonna be an aeronautical engineer even though I never really like talked about this in particular or, um, you know, kind of sat her down and talked about career opportunities and whatever. She just kind of absorbed it from me as I talked about the cool stuff that I got to do. And um, I think, you know, just, just kind of that um, supportive encouragement where it's not just like, you know, uh, here's what you need to do in order to become a, an engineer. It's just more of, um, you know, here, here's what I do in my life. And um, here's me being an example of, of what you can accomplish if, if you wanted to. Um, I, it's a little more soft, you know, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and, and also just, you know, I, I think in general, I, what I always do is I, I'm always building infrastructure and then opportunities present themselves to me. So for example, in high school, I, um, I was on the debate team. I ran cross country, uh, I did marching band, things that are not really like, you know, they're not STEM after school activities, but each of those things gave me a, a huge boost in uh, not only things to put on my application, but skills that I had that I could bring to that job. Uh, public speaking is, is uh, kind of rare among scientists. So if you're, uh, if you're able to speak and communicate, then that's going to put you a, a step ahead when you actually write a well-written application for something, or when you can give a talk that that's really good and somebody notices and is like, hey, you should come work for me. 
um, or uh, you know, just a lot of the soft skills that you can learn in, in other activities. So I always just encourage people in, in middle school and high school to do activities that they're interested in and not necessarily try to think like, oh, I need to join um, this, this, you know, the math club in order to major in math in, in college or something like that. Uh, rather than ticking boxes, just do the things that you're interested in doing and look for opportunities to engage in things that, you know, may, uh, maybe there's an opportunity to go to uh, a, a, like a space summer camp or maybe you don't get any of those opportunities until you're halfway through college like me. <laughs> um, when I got my first internship, that was the first like sciencey thing that I did uh, as an activity. Um, so yeah, I always just tell people to do the things they're interested in doing and look out for opportunities. Yeah, you might, well, I'm sure you know that the Astronomical League offers a number of youth awards every year. And you talk to people about this and, and they get the impression that we're doing it to try to uh, persuade kids to become professional astronomers. And I, I tell them, no, well, that's nice, of course, but you know, we, we, we do it to give kids an opportunity to, to see where their lives could lead, you know, what is out there, how they could improve themselves and give them a chance to explore what's in their heart about what they really like to do. And if they become amateur, I mean, excuse me, professional astronomers, even more so, I mean, that, 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 that's great. But you know, most of these students who participate in these programs don't don't become professional astronomers. A few do, but most don't. But I think they all come away with a better feeling of, of where their life could go and that the opportunities are, are available to them. So I think in that sense, that the program is a big, big hit. And I'd like to see a lot of, a lot of people yeah. become more involved. Well, not only the opportunity to see um, kind of what's, what's out there, but, but also you gain some some uh, like a particular mindset and some soft skills in the process of doing that. Astrophotography takes dedication and um, you know, so you gotta, you gotta work, you gotta figure out some hardware things and figure out some software things in, in processing. And those, those concepts carry over to any other field you want. Uh, even if you go into, I don't know, um, kinesiology or, um, of or art, you know, like the the things that you that you learn, it's it kind of kind of the, the softer things of of uh, dedication and, and hard work and and delayed reward and seeing a long term project come to fruition at the end of, of a few months of work and then being recognized for it. Mm -hmm. Those apply to any field you want to get into, and that will having having like learning at a younger age that you are capable of doing things that are difficult sets you up for doing things that are difficult later on as well but mm -hmm. you know you can do it because you've done harder things before yeah it's a big boost in your confidence yeah, yeah absolutely. Just solving goes. Hand, but in overall too yeah problem solving goes a long way i think in astronomy and astrophotography especially you are problem solving a lot constantly. of times constantly it's <laughs> never gonna always work right you know yeah. it's a perfect night but daggone that just uh, what happened to my camera <laughs> you know yeah. so you're always problem solving and something like that it does it bleeds over into everything you do because you kind of learn the process. I mean, as I was growing up, I learned as a kid, you know, I was pretty much on a mechanical end and you learned how to look at something and then start working backwards or however to figure out how do I fix this, what happened? And it doesn't matter what you do. That will always be a great uh, thing that you can do that will help everything that you get involved in. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you, Molly, for, for speaking to us. It, it is, Terry, do you have any more thoughts to-, to, to I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, um, I think we've pretty much covered most of it um, because I, I am curious, Molly, with your Girl Scout troop, do they do very much astronomy? I'm sure you've brought them into some astronomy. Do you see many of them very interested in it? So um, Girl Scouts has been making a big effort over the last couple of years to offer more STEM type badges and they've been partnering with, with companies to help develop these badges. And um, 
I, I always, I, I think I, I did, uh, uh, I, there's a couple of astronomy badges and I always tried to convince my, my girls to want to do it. And, um, and also some other kind of science tangential things out there. Um, and I'd say there was kind of like, like medium interest, you know, I think, I think a lot of, uh, I, I work primarily with middle and high schoolers as opposed to, uh, to younger kids, but, um, mm -hmm kids of all ages, when I've gotten to do um, like campery events and stuff like that, they love the idea of, of science. And um, I think everybody's always a little bit interested in being able to get their hands on things. And I, I led a, a bottle rocket station at, at campery each year. And it was a huge hit among, especially like the second to like, like the first grade to fourth grade level. Um, and I always liked to, uh, I would wear, I have this tie-dye lab coat. <laughs> I wear my tie-dye lab coat. And, you know, I would, I would tell the girls like, uh, I'm a real life scientist and I get to work with lasers. And they're like, lasers? <laughs> I think everybody thinks lasers are cool. Everybody thinks black holes are cool. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's not all we do or even a, a uh, you know, a lot of sciences is, is, you know, processing data and things that are somewhat less exciting, but, um, that's what kind of pulls you in is that, that those exciting things. And, um, I don't think I've, I've had really any girls that, that certainly weren't interested in it. I think, I think they're all interested in it a little bit, even if it's just like, oh, this is a fun activity. Okay. I'm going to go back to drawing my, my art now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's certainly a lot of potential out there. Um, a large audience to get interested in, in this. And I think we, we covered some, some of the thoughts here, but I know we didn't cover everything. And I know we don't have all the answers, uh, but uh, what, what Molly has said, I think is pretty encouraging. Uh, simply by being there. Uh, I can't remember there's that quote, but it's something like, you know, uh, be the change, be the change you want to see. So, you know, if, if you're in there, being a scientist, doing science stuff, then uh, that it, it trickles down or it shows other people what, what they could do. Mm -hmm. sure. um, okay, then. Well, I'd like to conclude then, since we, we've been rattling on here for a number of minutes now, that I really appreciate both of you taking your time out of your busy schedules to participate in this and shed some light um, on the whole topic. And it, it sure gets us thinking. Maybe we'll come up with even more ideas as, as the months go on and all that. But I appreciate it. So uh, thank, thank you, Molly, and thank you, Terry. Um, I'll be having this posted here in the next few days or so. Uh, and uh, it'll be on our YouTube channel. And we will also put it on our Facebook page. Uh, so unless you have something more to say, I'm, I'm willing to say goodbye. That's it? That's, that's it. Okay, everybody. Th thank you for attending. Clear skies. <laughs>